Thank you all so much. Um, we're going to move on to our last presentation of the afternoon. And I invite you all to remember to put your questions in the chat box to share. Um, our last presentation is on patriotism and oikophobia with John Prius and Christine Pfister of Pentimenti Gallery. John Prius's work focuses on the relationship between the material and the social and how the objects that surround us obscure and reveal our histories. Prius has been working with a warehouse full of materials collected from closed Chicago public schools as a way to entangle the mundane and domestic with the more abstract relationships we have to strangers through politics and social policy. His collaborative projects often invite broad participation and when possible include an educational dimension such as working with youth apprentices or Chicago public school students. His work is on view this month at Pentimenti Gallery here in Philadelphia, a gallery known for featuring content driven contemporary art. The gallery's represented artists regularly, regularly participate in international museum exhibitions and biennials and are included in leading institutional collections as well as private collections worldwide. Since 1995, Christine Pfister has been the co-owner and director of Pentimenti Gallery and has participated in lectures on art at institutions such as the University of Pennsylvania, the American Association of Museums, Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, Maryland Institute College of Art, among many more. Christine, um, I will turn the mic over to you. Yes, thank you, Lila. Um, I'm Christine Fister, and I'm the owner and director at Pentimenti Gary. Um, today, I have the great pleasure to have with me John Prius. Uh, at Pentimenti, we are welcoming the fall season uh, with solo, uh, solo exhibition of John, the State of the Union, and the show will continue to January 23rd, 2021. Um, but before, I would like to thank Craftnow, the Philadelphia Museums and Techne, for inviting us to participate in the celebration of culture of making. Um, it is our first year uh, joining Craftnow. And uh, I would be delighted to give you a quick run through our programs at the gallery. Uh, as Leila mentions, uh, we feature contemporary art that challenges traditional material and aesthetics by a line of internationally established artists alongside up and coming talent. Uh, since our founding in 1992, Penti Menti Gallery has gained national recognition by maintaining a commitment to process-based work and elaborate craftsmanship. Can we change the slide? Thank you. Our time, the exhibition program has expanded from abstract to figurative aesthetics to innovative work created from unconventional materials such as packaging tape, marine vinyl, or unbroided x-rays. Next slide. Um, every year, the gallery is invited to participate in national, uh, international art fairs. And in 2019, the gallery participated in Art Miami. Um, during the Art Basel Week uh, in Miami, we presented a group exhibition at our booth. And on this image, uh, you can see three cubes from Charles from the Chicago Archive series, Infinite Sets. Next slide. And the other fair as well that we participated in was Volta Basel, Basel, Switzerland. And during the art week, we had the pleasure to uh, feature a solo booth uh, with the sculpture of Ted Larson. Next slide. Uh, um, early this year, uh, we launched uh, uh, online platform designed to present exclusive exhibitions as well as, as promote transparent and informed access to rare to market and significant work by our represented artists. What you can find on Pentimenti Warehouse uh, is a series of exclusive work by uh, Michal Fargo, ceramics, uh, paintings, and works on paper by Kevin Finkley or Eric Spain, or ceramics again by Lauren Mabry with many other works. Next slide. 
Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to John Frears. Um, for the past decade, John interdisciplinary art practice has poetically investigated and sparkled dialogues about contemporary social, political, civic, and labor structures. Um, maybe a quick run through, a few words. Um, John Hall, uh, MFA from the University of Chicago. He has been the recipient of the Smart Museum Commission grant and the Chicago Cultural Center Taste of Chicago Project Award. This is for his most recent award. Um, his work is held within the permanent collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and he is represented by Pentimenti Gallery, Rona Hoffman Gallery in Chicago, and Rena Branston Chicago, oh, sorry, uh, Gallery in San Francisco. So um, this is my great pleasure to introduce you to, um, to John. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We we'll switch a mask. <laughs> mask switching. Um, so thank you, Christine, for inviting me, and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present my work to this forum. Uh, it's really interesting to see what other people are doing. Um, I um, so I'll say switch. I'm just going to run through some slides of my work. Um, um, and the, the slide that you see here has been the basis of my work, both as an artist and maker, um, contractor, collaborator, uh, since about 2013, when Chicago closed 49 public schools uh, at the same time. So it was, just, uh, it was a lot of um, upheaval in Chicago around this, um, this event. Um, and it's during the tenure of Rahm Emanuel. Um, and at the time I had a relationship with um, the city um, that, that gave me access to all this furniture that was gonna be taken to the landfill. Um, there was a, a lot of material got sent to other schools and, and uh, but there was a lot of stuff that they didn't have any use for uh, material that went back to the 50s early 50s all the way through the 80s and 90s so you know solid wood oak tables and things like that um, so at the time I was working with uh, actually switch switch slides please uh, so this is just a shot into the warehouse where all this it was about an 800 foot warehouse full of stuff, floor to ceiling, um, that was all bound for the landfill. So all the work that I'm going to talk about is based on this body of material. Um, next slide, please. Um, so. Prior to the large scale closing, there was one school that was closed. And at the time I was working with artist Deaster Gates um, and he and I had been working together for quite a few years by that point. And we're, um, uh, I was called by someone from the schools that said they had to clear one building out and I had access to a whole building that had become a sort of warehouse for all of these other Southside public schools. So Theaster Gates and I took about four semi loads of stuff out of this school before it was torn down um, and made work out of that material. And at the time he and I had been in conversations about, um, I was sort of taking a backseat in my own practice and working to build up his studio, um, hiring so I was running the studio and running a um, apprenticeship, a, a informal apprenticeship program with with kids, um, uh, young makers and artists, or people that wanted to be artists, um, so that we'd come in and work. I'd be guiding these young folks on making work for me and for Theaster, um, and. Um, 
and then his, as he got super famous, he got interested in other things and the apprenticeship dimension of his practice became less um, interesting to him. So my work diverged from his at that point. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is in 2014. Um, this is a project called The Beast at the Hyde Park Arts Center. Um, and this, this is maybe the, the project where I feel, feel like uh, the most ideas of interest to me all convened into one form. Um, so this is looking at the beast from one end of the Hyde Park Art Center. Um, as you can see on the right, there are garage doors that open up onto the street. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the interior of that bowl form, um, which became a social hub, event space. Uh, we did talks in there, musical performances. Um, and the main thing was encouraging local youth to use the space as a programming um, area for whatever they wanted to do. So they started a, a very successful open mic night um, that ran, I think every couple of weeks. Uh, so this is, a photograph of that event. Um, and it was the idea that's, I think, part of what's interesting to me about that particular material is it's, um, I mean, as all things are, it's embedded with history, um, but it has a somewhat political charge to it based on the history of the schools in Chicago, based on the upheavals of the closings. So it's sort of, um, drenched in pathos in a way. And, um, and I was imagining the, so the interior of the beast, if you can see behind all um, to the left there, those are all school tabletops that form the backdrop of the interior of the space. Uh, and maybe put simply the idea of uh, how is it that we collectively um, engage with past traumas and and um, uh, embed them in our ideas of the future. Uh, and one could, I guess I could, a lot of the work that I've done since is thinking about that idea from, from different perspectives. Next slide. Well, this is just another shot of some activity in the, in the beast. Next. Uh, and then more recently, I've done other projects that um, I try to build in some apprenticeship aspect to it. Um, and part of what's been interesting is how much of a struggle it is to, to for that process to work and maintain itself. And, um, but in this case, I, I had a show at the the Michael Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And um, I had an apprenticeship work with, apprentice work with me, a former CPS student named Kendall Hill. So he was helping me build these uh, stoops, I called them, or like a combination of staircase, you know, the front stoop being this, in a sense, social um, interface between your private and public life, um, but imagined as a piece of furniture. So I made a series of those for this exhibition that then became the um, seating for uh, for the for the exhibition for congregating. Next slide, please. Shot of Kendall at work. Next. So those are the stoops in uh, in an exhibition at the uh, Sullivan Gallery at the School of the Art Institute inside of a projection room. Next. Um, so this is at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Um, you can see on the on the right back corner. There's a. It, um, 
a whole bunch of teachers desks that were arranged to be the backdrop for a stage. And then there were this show, it's called the freedom principle. And it was, uh, it was investigating the relationship between experimental music and art in Chicago, um, focused particularly on the AACM, uh, which I can't remember what that stands for, but there were a bunch of uh, presentations and musical performances that would happen on that stage. Next. And this was a, another version of the same idea at the Chicago Cultural. It was, it was um, the Taste of Chicago Pavilion by the Chicago Cultural Center. So the, I worked with, I invited artists from Chicago to make these uh, seating modules, cubes, uh, which I call the Chicago Archive Series. I think of them in a way as, um, uh, as collections of material into this square form that then becomes seating in a, a sort of module for collecting uh, waste material of one kind or another. Um, so there ended up being a hundred cubes for the tent and then an image of mine based on Chicago blueprints became the sides of the tent. Next slide, please. So there you can see the, um, the tent sides. Next. Um, so a lot of the work is, um, I think there's some, no, I would describe it exactly, the relationship between functionality and, um, well, let me rephrase that. So, um, I, it didn't start out as a kind of a deliberate uh, objective, but a lot of the work, the more I work with this material, the more it starts to take on somewhat landscape-like quality. Um, so I have a, a set of objects in this exhibition, for instance, that I call shards that are the material kind of put together into the form of like a, a some kind of a landscape piece, a piece of stone or something like that. Um, and you can see it a little bit in this lamp and table. Um, and I think I, there was a quote a long time ago that I read from William Kentridge. Um, it's in one of his animated pieces where there was a scene where um, a person gets shot and dies and the landscape just covers over the body and becomes a stone. Um, and I think there's a way in which, you know, the landscape is constantly obscuring history. And I think there's a way in which the materials that we use has that same capacity to obscure what's happened before and where this material came from. Uh, and I imagine, you know, so I imagine them as these sort of landscape elements that end up in our personal lives that we kind of forget what they are and where they came from. Um, next slide, please. So this is a Rena Branston exhibition, I think in Miami, um, where the a table and the Chicago archive cubes became seating for people that would come in and um, look, look at her booth. Next. as another exhibition in Chicago. Um, this was a commission of a table and chairs that ended up in an artist friends collection. Next. This is out at the um, um, so this became the artist, the, the lobby uh, entry space into this the, uh, Chicago Biennial, which is held outside of Chicago. And I'm now forgetting the name of the 
museum. Um, so again, it becomes this meeting space. There's a couple swing sets in there made out of school chairs and desks. Um, uh, so I feel like I'm trying to bring in this element of education, playfulness, public interface. Next. Um, it's a recent piece, a rocking chair and lamp and carpet. Next. Um, then I included just a few, a handful of, of more uh, traditional domestic spaces. So this is a kitchen I did. Uh, this isn't with the school material that was prior to the, to that, um, working with that material. Um, but it's just to show that um, also with that material, it gets built into more, somewhat more traditional contract projects, functional spaces. Next. So in this case, it's a buffet. Um, and that's all pretty much 100% school material. Next. Uh, same here, this is another kitchen island, Chicago. Next. Set of bookshelves. Next. Um, how am I doing for time? Good. Okay. Five minutes, okay. Um, so this was another big collaborative project that I did. It's called Infinite Games. So this is a group of Chicago artists that came. Um, I invited, because there were 50-ish uh, schools closed, I invited 50 artists, designers, or art collaborations to um, respond to the material. Uh, Cause the question started to become more pressing to me. Like I, I'm just some random artist that has access to all of this stuff and the stuff um, from the schools is uh, it's an important body of material that I didn't feel like I was, um, you know, I mean, practically speaking, I was never going to use it all myself. Um, and I was really curious what other people would do with it. So um, I ended up inviting artists to come to the space, choose material that they wanted out of the space or respond to it in some way. Um, and then the results of that exhibition were shown in a, um, a domestic space, like a, a short-term rental um, where all of these pieces were built in. Um, uh, so I have some photos of that, a handful of them. Okay, next please. Uh, so this is one of the apartments in this space and there's work by Parsons and Charlesworth. The uh, chair shelf, the clock is by Misha Khan, artist in New York or designer, uh, ceramic pieces by uh, Mike Baker. Chicago artist. Next, please. Um, and this was a work by a Chicago artist named Inigo Manglano Ovalle, who took a chair, um, burned the chair, used the carbon from the burn to make ink, which he then used to print a photograph of the chair that was burned. The piece is just called ink. Next. Um, these are a couple pieces that are in the show here also uh, by a artist, photographer, multidisciplinary artist named Alberto Aguilar. And I collaborated with him by building the frames for the images that he took. He dragged the uh, furniture all over the country with him and then would fo photograph it in these various settings around the country um, and then leave it there often. Uh, it's called the Left Behind series. Uh, next. This is uh, Rahm Emanuel's address. Uh, artist Jason Lazarus is calling out Rahm Emanuel for the school closings. And again, this was a collaboration where 
Lazarus, um, it was his idea, and then we fabricated the work in my, my shop um, with some young apprentices in that case as well. Next. Uh, this is a clock called The Loner by Nisha Khan. Next. We're gonna, I'll skip this one, it's a video. Um, uh, so one of my favorite pieces, artist named Karen Reimer, who um, took photographs of markings on the bottoms of chairs and tables and then had those embroidered into cushions that became the seating or were on the chairs around one of the dining tables. Next. Um, this is a more recent project where I worked with a group of 20 kids to deconstruct school material, which was then built into an installation at the University of Chicago through the Smart Museum. Next. So that's the installation uh, at the School of, of Public Policy in, at the University of Chicago. Next. In use at the Harris School. Next. Um, that's my last show here. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, shot that was of that. actually your, your first exhibition in Philadelphia. Yes. Actually. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, uh, I mean, you want to say a few words with the, um, with the, um, the installation, the image. Yeah. Um, I think I've got like three. Okay. Should we? Um, yeah, just we yeah, okay. yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay, next one. Um, I've done a series of works with blueprints from the schools. I got a roll of um, blueprints from one of the janitor's closets at a school that was going to be torn down. Uh, so I built frames for them out of school material. Next. So another rocking chair. Next. Next. Um, close up of one of the cubes, Chicago Archive series. Next. And this is the shard that's debuting at the exhibition uh, behind us. You can see it sitting over there. <laughs> um, next. Also in the show right here. Next. And in the show over there. <laughs> I think that's it. So thank you. Thank you for giving us a window into your practice and the show is opening at Pentimenti. I do know there is going to be limited space for a walking tour coming up um, with the Center for Art and Wood and Clay Studio and Pentimenti. Is that? Yes, it, it's correct. It's going to be um, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we have time slot at 2, 2.45 and 3.30. And the meeting location is at Pentimenti Gallery. So we'll have um, the artist present to introduce the work. Um, the tour is limited to four people. Jen says there are four spots open. You have three, three, three um, slots. We have one at two, one at 2.45 and one at 3.30. And anyone interested in joining you can, how do they sign on? Yeah, there is, uh, yeah. Um, Jennifer is actually um, posting the, um, the information on the chat right now. I can see it. So you can directly sign up for the tour and sign up. You can pick your time, and uh, and but the media place will be at Pentimenti Gallery, and from Pentimenti Gallery we move to the Clay Studio and and go further. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Elizabeth, I don't know if you um, tracked any questions. We can open up for any question and answer and. Concluding remarks. What an amazing afternoon. I know I'm glad that I
spent a few hours away from the news <laughs> cycle this afternoon and thinking about craft and our communities and what's happening here in the city and beyond. Um, so thank you everyone so much for being here this afternoon with us. We, we knew it was going to be a challenge, but we also wanted to um, dedicate some time and space for being together. So um, again, thank you all. There was one question, uh, Layla, for John. It was from Catherine Pennypacker. It's, uh, what are the stoops covered with? And I'm not, I, I know you talked about your process, but I'm not sure you talked, answered that direct question. Um, variety of materials. So um, there, I think, I think I did seven of them in total. Um, and let's see, some of them were school material. Um, some of it was, um, I also, when I see a leather couch in the alley, I cut the leather off and then use that for upholstery. Um, there was one that was covered with um, clothing that was outgrown by my kids. Um, one of them covered with an old quilt that I don't use anymore. Um, uh, so a wide variety of, of materials. That, that was really the only question we had um, for you and for Christine. And thank you so much for opening your gallery up to us today, Christine, and for John for, for elaborating about your practice and um, uh, your work is beautiful. And I love uh, the engagement with the, the um, public school system. <laughs> it's fabulous. There is one question oh. um, that lends itself to asking about the school system, the material seems to have specific political meaning in the Chicago context. Does that meaning change or get lost as the pieces circulate? I don't know, John, if you have had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it does. It has a, a, a specific charge in Chicago, definitely, that becomes more abstract. I think the further you get away from Chicago, um, but I feel like the kind of general um, charge of the material remains as, I mean, I guess um, the fact that they were closed in that way and all at once and that it became such a political hot, it might have something to do with why he lost the next election. Um, I think it did. Um, so it has a very specific charge there, whereas school closings generally, I think, always have somewhat of a charge, but it doesn't take on that same, um, same specificity. Um, but I, I mean, I don't, you know, my sense is that it travels. People seem interested in the, um, what the materials are in other contexts outside of Chicago uh, that may not have any familiarity with the specifics of that story. Another question slipped in um, that, that as I was talking um, before, could you speak, John, about how ritual as a concept is part or not part of your process? Um, I mean, I guess I think of, I mean, there's a few, there's, a way to think of ritual as a sort of formalized practice versus just something you do all the time and that becomes part of your daily habitual activity. Um, um, you know, I haven't, I haven't given a ton of thought to how it functions for me as ritual. Um, yeah, so I don't have a specific answer to that question in my own practice. Fair enough. So if there aren't any other questions that might pop in, in the next second or two, I'll just make some remarks. So that concludes the presentation portion of today's symposium. I'd like to share a virtual round of applause as we all transition over to, uh, you know, to well, we did the questions and answers. So we'll, we, we've monitored our questions, excuse me, and. Uh, um, and I'd like to thank you again that we've truly enjoyed spending this afternoon with all of you um, and, um, and last week's program as well. Uh, please remember to visit the Philadelphia Museum of Arts Craft Show 
as well as uh, craftnowphiladelphia.org to learn more about their work and advocacy. If you're interested in learning more about craft or joining the museum's vibrant programming, and perhaps you'd like to become one of our, a member of our friends group, Techne, the Ambassadors for International Craft. I'm gonna pin a link to that as well in the chat. Um, otherwise, Layla, um, I'd like to, Layla and I'd like to invite you all to unmute yourselves for a minute to say hello and let, let's have a little ruckus, um, mm -hmm. if you will. We can you know, shout out questions and hoot and holler if we need to, um, but I just wanna thank you again for joining us and supporting us uh, by being present this afternoon um, and last week as well. And we hope to see you next year. So thank you very, very much.